This episode is brought to you by Choiceology, an original podcast from Charles Schwab. Hosted by Katie Milkman, an award-winning behavioral scientist and author of the best-selling book, How to Change, Choiceology is a show about the psychology and economics behind our decisions. Hear true stories from Nobel laureates, authors, athletes, and more about why we do the things we do. Listen to Choiceology at schwab.com slash podcast or wherever you listen. Our side has a rule of law problem because we really have not absorbed that at the end of the day, the law is whatever they want it to be. Hi, and welcome back to Amicus. This is Slate's podcast about the courts and the law, the rule of law, the Supreme Court. I'm Dahlia Lithwick. I cover those and other things for Slate. And since we last met... The justices have heard oral arguments in several cases, including one testing whether President Biden's loan forgiveness plan was constitutional. We previewed that case with Mark Stern in our Slate Plus segment last time, and Slate Plus members are going to get to hear the post-argument gaming on it later on in this show. We'll talk about that more in a minute. For the main attraction this week, it's been a while since we've talked to someone on this show who looks at the court through a really wide-angle lens and who maybe looks at the court for the political beast that it is rather than the institution we might once have been able to suspend disbelief around long enough to imagine that it is, in fact, not political. So this week, we are checking in with one of my personal favorite political analysts and thinkers, Michael Podharzer. He's former political director of the AFL-CIO, a longtime political strategist for labor unions, and the chair of the Analyst Institute, which is a collaboration of progressive groups that studies elections and applies scientific methods to political campaigns. By and large, I have found Mike to be a guy who consistently looks at elections and politics and more recently the Supreme Court using data. And he has arrived at some, I think, startling and important conclusions. Later on in the show, Slate Plus listeners are going to get to hear from someone who is not Mark Joseph Stern, but who is fancy nonetheless. Leah Lippman is co-creator and co-host of the award-winning Strict Scrutiny podcast. And this week, she also won a prestigious RBG award from ACS. And she's going to join us to talk about new abortion regulations, new litigation, the major questions doctrine, and much more. If you are not a Slate Plus member, go to slate.com slash amicus plus to sign up. Slate Plus members get access to ad-free versions of all of Slate podcasts and access bonus segments from shows like this one, Slow Burn, Political Gab Fest, and Slate Plus members never hit a paywall at slate.com. To sign up, go to slate.com slash amicus plus. But first, to Michael Potharzer, who is sometimes credited or co-credited with being one of the organizers who actually saved democracy around the 2020 election. He was recognized as an early leader in data-driven politics in his book, The Victory Lab, and in a private newsletter that he's been sending out to a small group of activists, he's applied his big, big brain to issues of voting rights and labor and organizing, and most recently, a lot about the U.S. Supreme Court. He recently left the AFL-CIO after 25 years, which is one of the reasons we get him here today. He's able to speak and write freely in this new chapter, and I'm so incredibly grateful that he's here to help us understand more globally how to think about the Supreme Court and the ways it is warping uh, the democratic system that we think we live in. So that was a huge, huge wind-up, Mike. But welcome, <laughs> welcome to the show. I'm glad to be here. Long-term listener, first-time podcaster. Mike, I think I want to start in an unlikely place. Uh, but one of the things that I've been reading in your newsletter, uh, in, with increasing, I think, ferocity in the last few months, is uh, a critique of the way we cover the court itself. And I, you've been taking a brick bat a little bit to, you know, my beat, which is fair because I've also been increasingly aware that we are doing this wrong. But I just wonder if you might be willing to start at the place of, I, I'm thinking of one of your newsletters where you describe 
the way we cover the court is the sort of surgical suite where we're all in there whispering about the patient and not realizing that while we're talking about like the aorta and the like using the clamps and whatever, this highly specialized conversation, the patient is kind of us and democracy and it's dying. Right. So will you start with your press critique? Because I think you are descriptively correct. But it's not said often enough and certainly not on this show that the way we're covering the court and the cases has become part of the pathology. Yes. It's like when Alito's opinion on Dobbs said that it had been wrongly decided, right? he was speaking for the coalition that put him there that essentially believed the 20th century was wrongly decided. And it was sort of coalition of the business interests that had been working to repeal the New Deal and the religious evangelicals who were trying to overturn the rights revolution, all of the things that were gained in the 20th century. And the challenge in the coverage of the court is that it is as if that coalition has fired a bullet at sort of us at the heart of democracy And what gets covered is the progress of the bullet today. And there's never a mention of who actually fired the bullet or what the actual intention is, right? And I think there's a great literature, and it's been in your work too, about all of the ways in which the Supreme Court has upheld property rights have done really regressive things. I think we're actually in a new stage of that in that we have a Federalist Society majority. We literally have six judges who were groomed and put there by an agenda. And it isn't just that there's a tendency to appoint conservative judges or something, which was bad enough. They're on a mission, and the mission should be covered. And also that what they do is so connected to the rest of what goes on over the last 15 years. So there will be coverage of Citizens United or Rucho or those kind of cases within the context of voting or within the context of drawing lines. But what isn't seen with that sort of narrow perspective is that the combination of those decisions has allowed half the country to basically go back to one-party rule in mostly the South, and that because of the representatives they elect, the senators, the idea that any of what they do can be undone by Congress is out the window, which means they're now the major legislating body in the country, and they're not covered that way. They've made more policy or undone more policy in the last decade than the Congress has made proactively in an even longer period of time. But none of that comes into it, and there's an artificial suspense about what they're going to do when they could not be more obvious about their intentions. So one Slight pushback, I guess I would have on the premise here is, isn't this exactly what the left wing of the court would do and would be doing if it were ascendant? In other words, I I agree completely, you know, this is the Fed sought court, you know, bought and paid for in some sense with federal society money. But would we be having this conversation if we were in the moment where Merrick Garland had been seated and Amy Coney Barrett wasn't there, but we had Katanji Brown Jackson and another liberal? Is it not the case descriptively that both sides play this game? It's just that you and I are grumpy that our side is losing. <laughs> um, I think that in one sense, at a very high level sense, it is true that our side is grumpy about what's going on. And this is a point that is very important in this moment because what I'm talking about is not so much the positive agenda of the left or the Democratic Party or that sort of thing. What I'm talking about is that over the back half of the 20th century, 
in a way that was fairly unprecedented in American history, there was a mobilization to make America a different kind of place and that adhered to democratic rules, always small d Democrat. I hate that that's the, so confusing. But if you believe that the most irreducible thing we have to agree on is the core democratic principles of we all have an equal vote and those votes matter, then this is outside of that, right? And it's outside of it not because of a popular movement but because of the resources of the people who put them there. It isn't organic. This isn't coming from the people. And these are judges that were appointed the last three by presidents who didn't have a majority of the popular vote, confirmed by senators who didn't represent a majority of the country. It's even more undemocratic than that because what the courts are doing with a lot of these laws is undoing what America spoke loudly about to get done. America went through the proper process to get these civil rights and now they're just getting taken away in a way that there's no immediate recourse. So one of the reasons I have been so enjoying your writing about the Supreme Court this fall and this winter is I think you've really deftly just named the problem. And the problem is the democracy-busting cases that the court is handing down. So it's not necessarily Dobbs or Bruin. It's, I mean, you list them, right. Citizens United, Shelby County, Brnovich, Rucho. It's the cases that make it harder to effectuate the democratic will. And I think one of the things that you've been saying over and over again is that that is a system problem that cannot be understood through the lens of, I'm just going to read you to you for a second. When the court was arguing Moore versus Harper, you wrote in your newsletter, we know the drill, SCOTUS reporters, cable commentators, self-described democracy defenders will tell us the facts of the case, deconstruct the stupidity of the independent state legislature theory. They'll make arguments against it. They'll speculate on whether the court will take a maximalist position. And you essentially said it is long past time when it should have been obvious we are victims of an intentional campaign. This is not principal differences. And that the way we cover cases is this kind of case by case, mm, affirmative action, good thing, bad thing, as though they exist in these atomized bubbles as opposed to this is a systems busting process. And the way to look at that, in your view, I think, is through all of these democracy warping cases. Is that a fair assessment of what you've been trying to get at? Very much, yeah. But it also tries to make explicit that those six justices are playing for the same team that Mitch McConnell is, that Kevin McCarthy is, that Fox News is. They're not separate. They're all part of the same agenda. And what each of them does makes the other stronger in a way that lets them make them stronger. McConnell puts the right judges on. The judges do campaign finance, so there are more Republican senators. And the gerrymandering so that Republicans can actually win a majority in the House and then they prevent Biden from – and it, it is a cooperative endeavor. It's not them off in their robes, unaware of that, not understanding the way this is all part of the same thing. So – this leads me to you, – you've written also a whole bunch about the ways this manifests in the states and you have this line where you say, Shelby Rucho Brnovich, the court has had this outsized role in shaping what you called, quote, the reestablishment of authoritarian enclaves. And I wonder if you just walk us through – that argument, because I think, again, it's data driven and it's complicated, but I think that it helps us understand how you can be in a red state that simultaneously, I'm thinking of Kentucky or Kansas, renounces abortion by ballot initiative, but cannot get out from under complete red state control. Sure. So it's a little bit different 
in places like Wisconsin, but in the old Confederate states, the states that did have Jim Crow laws, the process has been essentially the same. And and one of the things that's important that I should throw in here is I don't think, I'm not a fatalist about this. I don't think that this all had to be happening. I think that 2009 and 10, these forces hit the jackpot because of the backlash against Obama. The key moment, a way to get through get here, is November 4th, 2008, when my probably all the people listening to this podcast were pretty happy. And on that evening, McCain came on and graciously conceded that Obama won and began by saying that's an important positive thing for America. And to me, that's really what made the Tea Party. The Tea Party representing the religious and yet more problematic part of the Republican coalition that had been the junior partner realized that the establishment corporate part of the party had to go. And you have rhinos, the whole thing. From that point on, Tea Party was all the racist things we experienced against Obama, but it was also a political project to purge the party of people like McCain. And because their first election was 2010, they hit the jackpot because they got 83 new people into the House that were there through Tea Party fury. And it was a redistricting year, so they were able to gerrymander the House, but more importantly, the state legislatures, so that opposition to them like was never going to come, right? It wasn't possible at the state level. And since then, you know, at this point in the old Confederacy, the split chambers in Virginia is the only split in the there. It's all, it is as red today as it was blue before the Voting Rights Act. And it's been completely recreated. We are taking a short break to hear from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Choiceology, an original podcast from Charles Schwab. Choiceology is a show all about the psychology and economics behind our decisions. Each episode shares the latest research in behavioral science and dives into questions like, can we learn to make smarter decisions? Or... What is the power of negative thinking? The show is hosted by Katie Milkman. She's an award-winning behavioral scientist, professor at the Wharton School, and author of the best-selling book, How to Change. In each episode, Katie talks to authors, athletes, Nobel laureates, and more about why we make irrational choices and how we can make better ones. Choiceology is out now. Listen and subscribe at schwab.com podcast or find it wherever you listen. Are you having a hard time meeting great people to date? Why do you keep trying the same methods over and over if you know that you're set up to fail? It's time to say goodbye to swiping and bring back the human touch to dating with Talkify. Talkify is the country's number one modern matchmaking service that is designed to help you achieve relationship success. Their trusted compatibility specialists hand select successful and compelling candidates, so you can date consciously and productively. Here's how it works. The Talkify matchmakers meet with you to learn about what you're looking for in a partner. Then they select and screen potential match candidates for you, doing background checks, video interviews, and asking the tough questions that are too awkward for first dates. From there, your matchmaker plans your date introductions and handles all communications for you, creating a safe and stress-free dating experience. And right now, Talkify is offering our listeners 20% off when you become a client at Talkify.com slash amicus. That's T-A-W-K-I-F-Y dot com slash amicus for 20% off when you become a client. Talkify.com slash amicus. Let's return to my conversation with Michael Podharser. So I think what I want to ask is... If this is true, if what you are saying is true and that the engine behind this is partly the Supreme Court making decisions that go back to Citizens United, what's the fix? And I mean that with two parts. I mean, 
what's the fix in terms of how we re-engineer this so that it's doing what it's meant to be doing, but also those of us who are writing and thinking about the court in this, I think you're saying kind of childish, you know, I want to believe way. Uh, and again, I cop to it. I'm, I don't disagree with the assessment, but how would it look different? And I know that those two questions are totally different, so maybe take them sequentially. I think the essential part of the fix is not to jump into trying to think about what legislation we should pass or what kind of tweaking we need to do. Because if you understand what's going on, you realize we don't have the power to do any of that. The first step has to be acknowledging that this is what's going on. And you know, an interesting case study here right, is what happened in the last half of 2020 when the media went from covering Trump in a kind of both sides way, you know, if – he did something, someone had to be quoted as he was lying. If he was doing something, someone had to be quoted as to what he was trying to do. And that basically went away. And when it went away, everybody outside, like in the reality-based world, it concentrated everybody's minds. And we were able to overcome something for which if we'd been sitting doing this podcast in February of 2020, I wouldn't have been able to answer which is how are we going to get them to leave, right? But the fact that well, this coalition came together from corporate America to labor left was a product of everyone being on the same page, right? And that coalition has to come together again to make progress towards what we're talking about because otherwise there's not really a lever that we have right now that can – sure get us there because there isn't a consensus that it looks the way I'm describing. And so there's really not a consensus about what needs to be done. So on the, just on the media piece, I'm, I'm interested. You're saying essentially the second half of 2020, we stopped doing, on the one hand, right. you know, mail-in voting is all going to be fraudulent, says right. Bill Barr and Donald right. Trump. We just stop. We just start writing about Systems, I think, right. is what but you're also, saying. But also when Bill Barr, in the first half of the year, when – and a lot of the sort of democratic or progressive or nonpartisan groups really sort of fed into it, right? When after COVID hits, like any sane person says, let's do this election by mail, he comes out and says all this stuff about fraud and mail and everything. And – Immediately, there are studies about how mail was harder to commit fraud in, and it hasn't given anyone a partisan advantage. And the stories are Trump says this, they say that. By the second half, when Barr says it or Trump says it, they do comma, you know, for which there's no evidence or comma, right, without there needing to be someone quoted, right? They never just reported these lies. They debunked them in the process of reporting them. Right? And so you had a sort of coming together. It, there was the space for usually non-engaged actors to join that effort. So you're describing a process of learning in some sense, right? Yeah. It took three and a half years before the mainstream media could say Donald Trump is lying or as you, I think, are suggesting, Donald Trump is irrelevant. <laughs> Not interesting, right? It took three and a half years and probably three and a half years for this coalition you're describing. And I know you were um, uh, part of uh, the engine of that, of business and labor to come together and say, right. you know, we're doomed if this election is fought out on the streets. And now here we are in 2023, and it feels like, have we unlearned all of that? I mean, I feel as though we are now watching Tucker Carlson showing video suggesting that January 6th was tourists at the gift shop. The Dominion lawsuit, to me, is bone chilling in terms of Fox News personalities clearly knew that they were putting lies on air and did it. Is there a progression here towards something better? Or is this an ebb and flow and we are backslid to the point where both the media and I want to say big business are sliding back to sort of pre-2020 
Oh, yeah. And that's the sort of really hard thing to swallow about the situation we're in is that the sort of mainstream world wants to believe that after winning an election, that's it. Right. Right. And now we can go back to the stuff we have fun doing that we are going to talk about how we've restored normalcy to the system. And it's like instant amnesia, just recurring amnesia after each election since 2010, right? It's like, oh, well, we lost that one, but let's get as if there's nothing to learn from it, right? You could see in the reaction to the midterms this happening where it was – not as bad as the conventional wisdom said it was going to be. And that somehow became a victory for democracy with nothing to temper that enthusiasm. And you know, it only takes a couple months to realize, oh, yeah, like they own the house now and look at what they're doing. And it's reflective on the court reporting too. It's that they understand that this is a war. They have a long-term goal. And they're fighting it. And then every time they do something, we all treat it as, oh, my God, they just did this thing. Let's react to that thing rather than seeing it as in this larger context. Mike, you had such a, a, I thought, a really thoughtful piece. I'm going to just quote you back to yourself again. Um, But but you said – of the 122 pro-insurrectionist Republicans on the ballot, an astonishing 94 percent faced no possibility of electoral consequences in the midterms for trying to overthrow the president. Right. This is exactly what you're describing, yeah. that we like to say January 6 was aberrational, the system held, you know, all these 60 lawsuits get kicked away, greatest democracy in the world, spike the football, and we don't understand that – we were hanging by a thread uh, in the 2020 election, hanging right. by a thread in January 6th, and that in the midterms, because of the structural stuff you're describing, the gerrymandering, the vote suppression, more v. Harper, uh, there's no consequences uh, th- throughout the system. Right. And that essentially almost 100 percent of the victory consisted of not losing. Right. Right. With the exception of Katie Hobbs. Um, winning the governor's office and because of the independent commission taking the Michigan legislature. This is not trivial, but really there was not an advance of democracy, right? It was just uh, Kerry Lake is not governor of Arizona. And one of the things I was saying about this is that you'll never get to the Super Bowl by beating the spread every week. And we seem to be a side that just cares about beating the spread and not like actually winning. And one of the things that's distressing beyond just the McCarthy is that with good reason, there was the response to all the laws that were passed by Republicans and to take away voting rights and stopping the Freedom to Vote Act and all of that. And we properly talked about how damaging those laws were to democracy And yet in that sort of victory lap about democracy winning, no one even mentioned the millions of people who either didn't vote or had it uh, become much harder to vote in the 2022 election. It's like you basically like grandfathered every anti-democratic thing that had happened and then said, OK, we start again. So this, unfortunately, inexorably, Mike, brings me to money. And it brings me to money insofar as, you know, I think one of the things you think about so much is, again, the corrosive impact of Citizens United. And we are now sitting in a studio. You know, we now know that Leonard Leo got $1.6 billion to do. Uh, I suspect that buying a state Supreme Court seat is like <laughs> not that much more expensive than like buying the chair next to you in the studio. Well, it's like, actually become a little more expensive now. <laughs> it is a little expensive, but it's really like $1.6 yeah. $1. billion is a yeah. lot of money if you want to break democracy. And I guess I want you to reflect on – the amount of just huge 
untraceable dark money sloshing around the system, we don't have a way to turn the spigot off. And I don't think we even fully understand when you started talking, you were talking about these sort of FedSoc justices, that this is different. There's no ACS justices, right? right. There, Elena Kagan is not coordinating with Chuck Schumer. Right. Um, I don't think. What do we do about the fact that this seems as though I mean, I'm just looking at an article about Leonard Leo is going to start some like new cultural program to like make movies about you know, old school Fed sock values. What what do we do about the fact that one person seems to be in control of not just the Fed sock justices, but state Supreme Court races and increasingly, I should say, vote suppression around the country? Yeah, I think the way to look at Leonard Leo and the money and all of that really is that it's making it easier to see what's been happening anyway. It's he didn't like invent a thing right? I mean, someone had wanted $1.6 billion of value from him doing this. And that's who we should be paying attention to, is the people who are putting all this money in, not the people who actually get to spend it. It isn't really the issue. The issue is, to whom is it worth $1.6 billion for Leonard Leo to do these things? And the efforts to do the kind of project that we're talking about began the day after Franklin Roosevelt was elected. And for 50, 60 years, they went nowhere. And then in the 70s, it just started to come apart in this crumbling way where each of their victories weren't just victories for a substantive thing, but it was a victory for disempowering people and from disempowering the structures for collective pushback that kept the, you know, through the 30s to the 60s. And, you know, it's another kind of less part covered part of the court in terms of what they've done with standing and arbitration and jury trials and all of the kinds of class action and all the ways people used to have to maybe have a way to get accountability that just keep getting taken off the table in a very quiet way. And the fact that they're off the table enables more money making, more transfer of power, all of those things. And then it comes back and it's just, a, you know, it's a snowball effect. So actually, this brings me to a conversation you and I have had offline in the last year or two, which is, I thought that the John Roberts wing, the pro-corporate side, was going to, at the end of the day, bring some sanity, right? I mean, the story is that that's why the Affordable Care Act wasn't right. struck down. It was good for the insurance companies. John Roberts knew that. And I think one of the things you've identified in your writing of late is this fissure between what's good for capitalism and business yeah. in the FedSoc wing of the party and what's good for, you know, what you call, I think, sometimes, you know, white supremacy and white Christian nationalists and, you know, religion and culture war stuff. And we certainly see that fissure at the court. And one of the things you and I spoke about, I remember – around the time of Moore v. Harper is where's big business in this? Why doesn't corporate America have skin in the game here? Do they really want state legislatures to, you know, at the end of the day, hand all power to themselves for all time? Do you have a theory of the case of sort of why it is that capitalism isn't solving this problem? <laughs> um, that not going to get put in a position of like, wondering about our capitalist gods but <laughs> the, and why they've let us down. Um, the, I think that there, with, for justified reasons for several decades, I think the establishment corporate part of the Republican Party underestimated the potential of the Christian nationalist part of the coalition and if you sort of look at a lot of the never Trumpers, they're people who miscalculated. They're not just never Trump because they object to what Trump is. They're never Trump because the Trump party doesn't want them. And I think they felt like offering 
was saying, your agenda overturning Roe. Well, we can't do that in Congress, obviously, so we've got to take our time and do it through the courts. And I think for most of those Republicans, it was sort of a way to pat them on the head and say, put off forever having to deliver on their agenda. And so I think they really just underestimated it. And you could see them underestimate it again in their autopsy report, right, which just really did not understand what was happening underneath them. And so this gets back to why I said this is all contingent too, right, that that set of things had to happen. And so right now I think the nature of the part of corporate world that came together against Trump tends to be very short-term in its thinking. And if there isn't a need to act today, we'll let it go and we'll figure it out tomorrow. And I think that's how they've backed off. But I do think that the fact that it wasn't a cheerleading session in the oral arguments reflects that there are elements of the corporate part of the federal society that are all having been burned, are all nervous about by like, giving these gerrymandered legislatures even more power. And so I have no idea how it's going to – I mean, it's, a, that's there, it's an intramural fight. But I think that's what's going on. More with Michael Podharzer in just a minute. But first, a few words from our sponsors. And we're back with Michael Podharzer. You have written, and I think also this is true, that this conversation about the legitimacy of the court, which, by the way, I think is my beat, the legitimacy <laughs> beat, is kind of beside the point, too. I think it's beside the point in the same way you just checked me on Leonard Leo is beside the point. Who cares, I think, is what yeah. you're saying about whether people believe that the court is a magical, you know, palace in the sky full of oracles. It's a distraction from a systems problem, right? right. It's a, and it's also that our side has a rule of law problem, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, right, because we really have not absorbed that at the end of the day, the law is whatever they want it to be. And we've lost the moral vocabulary we had in the 60s that King and others gave us to the idea that things could be legal without being legitimate. And that it, like a legalistic obsession obscures our moral vision and makes us not ready to understand when it's necessary to go up against illegitimacy. And that's what's here, right? I mean, the court is not legitimate. There's so many different ways to say it. It's like how they didn't have the presidents who appointed them, the senators who approved them, the actions they're doing, and that it's all in service of an agenda. So what they do is like only accidentally legitimate, right? Like that has to be like more fully absorbed. So, so you're echoing Sherilyn Eiffel on this show a few months ago who said, you know, where's the legal academy calling out, you know, false facts and opinions? You know, where is accountability uh, for lawyers who right. say things? And I, I guess I'm wondering, give me a, a taste, if you would, of what that sounds like, that sort of clarion king-like voice that says the fact that the court says something is lawful doesn't – it's not the end of the conversation. What right. does that sound like? In the aftermath of World War II in Europe where the Western European countries had just gotten through – on the continent, had just gone through a period where fascists had come to power mostly through elected means and didn't work out well for them – that in most of their constitutions, there are provisions about like just baseline criteria for being able to participate in the democracy, right? And it's kind of called militant democracy now. But basically, in Germany, if you're a Nazi party, you don't get on the ballot. And there's an understanding that the, a big weakness for the way democracies have been thought about is if you give people who want to destroy democracy the same standing that you give people of any substantive point of view, then they're going to win. And 
that was, to me, one of the genius parts of the Voting Rights Act, which is that it was an anti-democratic act in a way, in the sense that it didn't deal with the fact that Southern legislatures would elect representatives who would pass laws to keep black people from voting. And so it said that a bureaucrat in Washington could say, no, you can't do that. And so for quite a while, we were comfortable with the idea that something could have legal origins but be illegitimate. And that to me was a big part of what was devastating about Shelby was that it went back to the Jim Crow era, let's see what they do. And then, of course, we'll be able to fix it. There is no fixing fascist attacks on democracy after they've happened. I think there has been in this country in our, my lifetime an understanding of that and a willingness to, in, to embrace that. And that's what's sort of fallen away. And I think with, you know, you listen to King's March on Washington, all those speeches, right? He's taught, he's appealing to a higher legitimacy than what the Justice of the Supreme Court's doing. Right. That's William Barber. Yeah. And I think, I guess I want to end this conversation by saying, you know, I've said it a couple times, I'll say it again. You were sort of part of this coalition that came together to really war game out and troubleshoot what could happen in 2020 to set aside the election. I, I think that it is true that we are in what I think of as a kind of foot race between, you know, demographics and organizing and, you know, the the sort of inherent sense that the bulk of this country, and I know you think about this, young people in this country are not super interested <laughs> in fascism and authoritarianism. And as you say, these illiberal anti-democratic machines that I, I think are strong to the point of possibly unbreakable. And I want if we are in a foot race, you know, where we have one side that is just, as I say, you know, getting things on the ballot in Michigan and making sure that abortion rights are protected or making sure that the Electoral Count Act is reformed so we can never again have claims that the vice president can set aside the election. Yeah, All thank the, God that Kamala Harris is not going to be able to overturn the election. Right, now. right, exactly. <laughs> that was a big win. Because you know she's been plotting that one. But I, these yeah. things are important. And the work that you did in 2020, I think, to build bridges between not necessarily uh, folks who had common interests. All that's happening in one lane. And in the other lane, we have this sort of like Victor Orban, really scary, I think fast moving, illiberal impulse. I want you to tell our listeners why you think Team A is going to win. And I want you to tell them, I mean, I'm not even asking you to like pray to the, the capitalist gods, but I'm just saying it feels to me in part inflected by what you said, which is that we are asleep. We just keep right. saying this is the greatest democracy in the world. The system held, you know, I'll check back in in 2024. How, what is happening that I don't know about that makes sure that those forces of coalitions, democracy repair, um, you know, broad-based groups of people who think that maybe authoritarianism and fascism are bad. What are they doing to outrun what feels to me like a really well-funded multinational enterprise to do away with democracy? The, I know it's a big question. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> um, I mean, I think it really is waking up. When it happens, it'll just happen. Think to hear square. The defeat of this sort of problem is usually not a continuity, right? I mean, it's like something happens and that's the final straw, or people start to come to a different understanding of the world we live in. Putting aside, which is a big putting aside, because I don't think it's actually it, all of what you were asking, but in terms of the civil rights and abortion and all of those things, as you said with Kansas, Kentucky, all of that, soft power in this country is overwhelmingly against their agenda. And so their agenda lasts only as long as soft power doesn't mobilize itself. And that's why I pay attention to what the media is doing because the media 
really either ignores or underestimates the importance they have in everything we're talking about. I'm going to say something that may sound like a little bit odd, but putting aside the people who were genuinely mentally ill that did the attack January 6th, they were there because they actually believed that their country was getting stolen. Mm -hmm. And that's what people who believe their country is getting stolen look like, right? They are the people who threw tea in Boston Harbor, right? The problem is that there was no truth to it, right? That, But because their information system was completely 100% describing a reality in which Democrats were pedophiles and were going to take everything. I mean, it, it, their acts were rational if that's their worldview, mm-hmm. right? They actually try to steal the election and like nothing happens on our side because – there's this ambiguity about it in the media. There's a, you know, well, maybe DeSantis will beat Trump or maybe we'll win this election or, right, there's no acknowledgement of what's actually happening in the country. And so from Citizens United to each of these steps, it's like kind of, eh, that was kind of bad, but, you know, we'll go back to what we're doing, right? And so the media just plays a huge role in that because, it, it is team normal. It's team nothing to worry about about this, and or at least that there are two sides to it. And that makes it really hard to mobilize people. So this is fundamentally your critique of court reporting, too, which is that if we amble into the court and say, you know, affirmative action, yes or no, you know, or the Indian Child Welfare Act may be good, may be bad, what we are doing is playing a part in this treat it as though the system is normal and we're having a sort of debate on the margins about the quote unquote case. And what you're saying is, no, but actually the system is a pipeline to more breaking of democracy. It needs to be written and thought about that way. Right. And that's that's the critique of the political press, too. Yeah. Michael Podharzer was recognized as an early leader in data-driven politics. He recently left the AFL-CIO after 25 years and where do people read you now, today? Um, well, actually just started a substack. I know it. And uh, uh, the one of the first essays was the one we're talking about, which is about the Supreme Court concluding that the 20th century was wrongly decided. Okay. So people should be subscribing and reading. And I will say this because I've been reading you for quite some time. You assign homework like you really do. <laughs> this is not a, 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 a light lift class. Like you are you know, can't get a gentleman's C in this class. You have to really do the reading. But I have been ever so grateful for both the work you do, but also um, I think the reframe that you give us in a moment where I think, as you say, the tendency is to do what we did yesterday over and over again until we're little like nubbins of brokenness. <laughs> so thank you so much. Oh, thank you. And I just so appreciate all the your writing and the podcast and really glad to be here. And that's a wrap for this episode of Amicus. Thank you so much for listening in and thank you so, so much for your letters and your questions. You can always keep in touch at amicus at slate.com or you can find us at facebook.com slash amicus podcast. Today's show was produced by Sarah Burningham with studio production from Patrick Fort. Welcome to Slate, Patrick. Alicia Montgomery is executive producer of podcasts at Slate and Ben Richmond is our senior director of operations and we will be back with another episode of Amicus in two short weeks. Until then, take good care.